Hello and welcome to episode 11 of the V2 Academy. I'm Chris Laffin and as always I'm joined by Peter Prickett. How are you doing, Stephen Peter? Very good, thanks. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> All right, shortly we're going to be joined by Manchester United Academy coach Tom Statham. But first, as it's the end of the season, I thought we would quickly discuss award shows and particularly how many awards should be given out. Um, this came about because I had a discussion with a player who's moved clubs and at his old club everybody got something. And at his new club, only the player's player gets it, and it's, uh, I think it's most improved player. When you say everybody got something, what did they get? Do you know? He didn't go into much detail, but he was up, I, I'm guessing. Well, like he said last year, he got one for effort. Okay. <laughs> so I think participation award. Participation. Yeah. Um, should we give people awards just because they really tried? Or should they just try anyway? Yeah. Just a thought. Um, <laughs> I'm not, I don't think that they should get nothing. They put in, if they put in the season and they've worked hard and they've been committed, they should get something better, more than just a well done. Yeah. But I don't believe that they should be given a trophy or a medal for showing up. Mm. You get a trophy or a medal if you earn it in other ways. This year, we just, uh, at my club, we've got rid of the participation medal and trophy. Yeah. It's taken a long time, but I finally had enough support that when I said, uh, guys, can we um, can we buy football more footballs instead? I got enough support that it got through. So they don't get a medal or trophy for participating. They get a size two football. The reason yeah. I chose a size two was because you could treat it as a skill ball for all of them. So, we are still giving out players' player, parents' player, coaches' player. Yeah. But unless they have been particularly successful in their league or cup or whatever, and the officials, the FA or whoever it is that's running the competition, have handed us medals to give out for a successful, however you want to look at a successful season on the pitch they're not receiving a medal or trophy. But they are getting something, and hopefully something that they can use. Quickly remind me, listeners, what age you work with? Um, well, my my particular team, I've got under-16s at yeah. the moment. They'll be under-17s next season. But at the club, I oversee everyone. Yeah. Um, I, I, towards the end of the training season, I took the new set of... What will be under eights next year? I can't say they're under sevens now. Um, they only had four weeks of training, so they won't be getting in this thing. Not surprised. Yeah. Not surprisingly. Hopefully, they come back in the summer. Yeah. Well, my argument with him was that if he didn't win anything this year, would the disappointments make him play better next season or imp- make him improve his skills for next season? I don't, I'm not sure that the motivation in the lower reaches of grassroots football really works in that way um, and also you just don't know the way that leagues get reorganised you don't know who your opposition are going to be mm. um, I mean suddenly a team can become really successful next year having been quite average the previous year and the reason is that there's been a reshuffle and they're actually in with a whole bunch of not very good teams Yeah, <laughs> it's not that they've improved particularly <laughs> But who they're playing against is just you know, the standards just falling off a cliff. So in my research, um, I found a club who definitely give a award to everybody, but they don't call it a participation award. But, uh, here's, here's a list of some of the awards. They had a um, player's player and um, player of the season. They also had um, the Good Sports Award. They so the, that's being a nice guy. The Winning Spirits Award. Same <laughs> Most Fun Player Award. Best. That's, that's we like you. That's we like you, but you're not very good. Yeah. Best effort award. Yeah. Leadership award. St- team spirit award. Most energetic player. Best listener. Role model. Best teammate. Communications. The love of the game award. And the hundred and ten percent award. 
It's 14 so I'm awards. Guessing so, <laughs> so assume it's what I'm a bit by. I'm guessing that the club that gives the 110% award doesn't also give an award for maths. Isn't given 110% and the best efforts award? I think a lot of them are the same thing. They just need to call them all different things. They are. They are. <laughs> I think a lot, a lot of those are for the guy who turned up um, and tried quite hard but wasn't very good. Yeah. Uh, but they just, just don't want to call it that. There's, um, there's one that I was at a club where they gave Clubman of the Year award. I'm a little bit torn on these because someone who does turn up and show a good attitude and so on and so on, role model, is great. But again, should we give an award to someone who's just doing his best? What they should be doing. I'm turning into. I'm turning into Steve Buscemi at the beginning of <laughs> Reservoir Dogs here. When we're talking about tipping. Yeah. Do we do we reward people for just doing what they're supposed to do? I don't know. I'm I'm not sure. Um, it depends what the award is as well. Yeah. That's the thing. Uh, I know that there are some clubs who did their award ceremonies quite early. Did it at Easter, and they gave all of their players an Easter egg. Yeah. That that was their end of season. Thank you for being a part of it. Award. I think, I think for most of these they gave out certificates. Not, I think I think that to be said. So. Yeah, it was, and that I don't mind that either. But without being too harsh, medals and trophies are for success on the on the pitch. I think, however, however old you are, if you teach people you get medals and trophies for not being successful, you're probably not going to get successful players. And I'm going to make it clear again that I'm not saying don't give them something. Yeah. Give them something. But just don't give them the same thing that they get if they are actually victorious. And we're delighted to be joined online by Tom Statham. How are you doing, Stephen, Tom? I'm um, very well, thank you, Chris. Uh, how have you been since we last spoke in 2015? All good, really. Just uh, yeah, luckily carrying on work that uh, I was doing at the time, my coaching and, and setting up different uh, tournaments and, and festivals and things like that, so yeah, it's all been good, thanks. Yeah, so for those who don't know, um, Tom is a football coach with over 20 years experience with Man United and was the FA's Foundation Phase Academy Coach of the Year in 2015, and, um, That's correct. Yeah. <laughs> and any opinions Tom gives during this interview are his own and not that of Man United. Yeah, it's so, important just to get clear. <laughs> speaking as I'm speaking as an individual. Yeah, I'm not representing the club at all. All right. So just quickly for those who didn't hear the first interview, can you remind us how you got into the game? Uh, well, like uh, you know, like a lot of people that uh, that really work in, in football, I, I played um, had, a, had a brief professional career. I played for the likes of Doncaster, Lincoln City, Middlesbrough mm. um, in the early '90s, and then when I finished uh, playing. I went into teaching. I, I was at Loughborough University before I went into professional football, which was quite unusual. And then, uh, so when I when I finished playing, um, I went into teaching, and uh, I was a PE teacher, and got a job in the, the Manchester area, and got invited to you know, work in the academy. In, uh, well, that was in 1993. I got invited, started at the beginning of '94, yeah, and uh, have been lucky enough to to be working in the academy at Manchester United from that time. Yeah, and away, away from Man United, you run SpecialistSoccerTours.co.uk. Can you tell us a bit about the company? Yeah, I, I also, one of the other things I work in is private education. So yeah. I've also, as well as working at Manchester United, I've worked at Shrewsbury School and, and I've been the director of football coaching at Repton School uh, since 2005. Yeah. And Specialist Soccer Tours was a way of combining the two worlds of professional football and private schools because... Private schools have got fantastic facilities, you know, boarding facilities, um, you know, great uh, kitchen and, and food facilities. So it's an ideal place to stage festivals and tournaments. So uh, I, I just, first of all, it was it was almost an accident. I'm talking to people that I knew in academies mm. and said, well, I'll put something on, you know, something pre-season. We got together and um, at Shrewsbury School it was initially and used the, you know, the great pitches and the, and the boarding facilities at Shrewsbury School. Got a few clubs together and it's just grown from there. That was again, probably about 2004 when that began and, and then it's grown. So now I run various tournaments and festivals through Easter and summer 
um, involving teams from all over the world, really. I've got teams from America, teams from uh, Scandinavia and different parts of Europe, and as well as mostly UK-based teams from Scotland and, and Ireland as well. So, yeah, it's really, it's really rewarding. And... Uh, it's great to see. I, I get a big uh, kick when I see teams like Aberdeen playing against Plymouth Argyle and things yeah. like that, where the games wouldn't have happened unless they'd come together at, at my festival. So, yeah, that's uh, that's what I enjoy doing really during the summer. So, is, there, is it the festival? Is it a tournament, or is it just just play well, friendly I do games? Both. Against? I do yeah. both. So, uh, it, it has been just festivals. Um, you know, so usually pre-season where teams can get together in, a, in say really good conditions, really good environment, uh, where the emphasis isn't on the results, but it's just on player and coach development. And, you know, we want people to, to mingle after the game and eat and, and discuss things during the evening. I mean, I, what I did this year at one of my events, I just got all the coaches together one evening and we, we, we got a room, we got some uh, soft drinks and we got a few beers and we just sat around for two and a half hours chatting about football really informally. Yeah. But we got people from Norway, people from you know, Scotland, Dundee United were there, Chelsea, Manchester United, um, you know, and clubs like Bristol City. So everyone just sat around chatting football, which was fantastic. Um, and I think that's where a lot of real learning and coach education comes from, you know, that informal setting. So, um, you know, that, that's that's the sort of thing. And then to say this year, well, this year, 20, 2016 for the first time I actually did tournaments where we did take in the scores. Um, I've been reluctant to do that, but the because uh, I thought it would take away from that emphasis, but it didn't at all. Mm. You know, we everyone was still looking to develop players rather than you know trying to win games, um, and I think it helps being in August because uh, everyone's focusing on the coming season, so they want to get to know the kids, practice different systems of play, possibly, um, and give everyone an opportunity to get some game time under the belt. So, how, how does your coaching as an individual? differ between your days at the academy and then your days during the festival well i don't in the festivals i don't coach yeah. at all I, i'm purely there as the event organizer oh, right. so i i make sure that all the, the facilities that are there for the team we we're based at, this summer we've been based at oakham school for the last uh, two or three years which you've got oakham schools in rutland um it's right near oak um rutland water it's beautiful countryside the, say the facilities are superb the pitches are, are academy standard so my role um, with the tournaments and festivals at Oakham School is just purely organising the event. So uh, because I've been a coach for so long, I, I know what coaches want. I know what they, you know, the sort of facilities and the attention that they want during the time there. So I make sure that everything's laid on for them, and so they can just concentrate on the football. So the food is fantastic there. The, you know, so the pitches are great, and um, so that's my role there. And obviously, when I'm working for Manchester United or Repton School, where I'm the director of football coaching, it's a private school. Then I'm all about you know, the players and, and looking to develop them. So the two very different roles. So you, uh, we'll talk about the uh, the festivals. What do you feel that the teams get? out of your festivals that it wouldn't from their normal games program well so much of working with the kids is getting to know them as individuals because i think that's one thing as a coach that I've, I've come to appreciate is that people focus very much on the training session or the match and it's a relationships business it's it's some it's something where you've got to get to know the players that you're working with whether it's a premier league level or whether it the kids are eight, nine years old. The most important thing is establishing that, that positive relationship where there's a level of trust and care between the player and the coach. And I think when you go away for two or three nights um, to an event like a festival or a tournament, then you can spend lots of time with the boys, you spend lots of time with them off the pitch in um, meal situations so you can sit and eat and, and have a chat with them in those sort of informal situations. The boarding houses that, that we use at Oakham School have all got... Uh, common rooms with TVs and, and, and sofas and things like that so you can sit down and, and chat there. They've also got meeting rooms so you can have more formal discussions as well. So I'd say what you're getting by attending a festival is all the benefits off the field as well as just seeing them perform on the field. And you mentioned that the uh, the coaches get together and discuss things as well. Um, yeah. And it just sounds like actually it's a very informal form of CFP yeah. for yeah. coaches and for players, it's almost like the art of conversation being rediscovered. Definitely, and again, that, that's something that I've been on lots of coaching courses, and it's very formal, and you watch the, the mentors do a session, and then you've got to take notes, and then you've got to reproduce that session, and that's just to try and pass a certain qualification. 
But most of us that have been in any sort of education know that that's not the best way to learn. The best way to learn is to to, dis- you know, to, to discuss things and see people in action and then observe and maybe then try it out yourself rather than having that pressure of having to pass a qualification. So you know, just sitting down, chatting to someone, a group of people for an hour or two, you're going to find out a lot more how they work and what they do with their kids and, and what their program's like, um, much more than, than if you're in a, in a formal um, qualification-based setting. Um, so yeah, that's something that I feel really strongly about and that, that I'd like to look to get into in the future is somehow doing some... Um, some coach education that isn't linked to a qualification. So it, it, we're there to learn. So we're there to learn from each other, you know, possibly from me with my experience, you know, to, to set the tone and, and be there as, as a resource, really. But for people to come to me and say, well, how would you know? I'm working with such an age group. With, you know, this, this is the space that I've got. This is the amount of equipment that I've got. You know, what would you do and have that backward and forward, have that interaction? Because I think a lot of qualifications or a lot of sessions that you see from demonstrations are not really relevant to many people when they go back to their clubs. So I think it's, it's really finding that, that balance between having formal qualifications but having information and learning that's relevant to the coach in their environment. Yeah, I mean, I, I've seen, I've been on plenty of courses and what's delivered on the course is not necessarily possible to deliver at a group's club. Exactly. The attitudes are different, the ability levels are different, the attention span is different, so we can't have catch-alls. Well, but, I, a picture I've done them myself, I've been asked to go to conferences and I've done a session. And as a coach, you want to put on a perfect session because you might have people watching you. So you end up doing something that you think will look good and run well and not necessarily do with my kids even. You know, it, it, the sessions that I've done at, at conferences and things like that are really not that, that closely related to um, what I would do with my kids. So and what but what you'd want, if you were watching that session, you don't want to watch me coach a perfect session that is totally relevant to you and, and what you're doing with your kids back at your club. So that's why, I mean, I... I've been speaking to a club in Sweden and they're, they're looking for me to go over to Sweden for three or four days and just observe. So be there and observe their coaches, observe their kids and just provide feedback. And I think that's, I'm really interested in that and it's something that I hope happens because I think that's a much better way of, of me um, imparting my experience that, that I've been looking at to gain and helping people rather than just doing random isolated sessions. On your website, it also mentions um, a coaches only tour. Um, yeah. What sort of things would the coaches on that tour get to access that they wouldn't normally see? Yeah, well, that that's something that hasn't that hasn't actually happened. That we've never uh, had one of those. But what my vision of it would be to have um, a group of coaches. I've, I've, I've got good relations with a number of clubs in America. <laughs> Try to bring this off, but it's never quite happened. Right. But what I'd like to do is is bring a group of coaches over um, to England. Um, it, it could be English coaches even, but get a group of coaches together maybe for four or five days and go and observe some sessions. But again, once you've seen the session, discuss what, what's happening or have those forums where we discuss certain situations and I will then put on sessions according to their requirements. But also what, what I'd want to do is to go and watch some games. So in, in maybe four or five days, watch two or three games, maybe professional games, maybe academy games, and then discuss the games afterwards. You know, and, and just the, getting back to this idea of talking football, you know, just, just sitting around with people in an informal situation where no one's afraid to speak and just talking about the game and, and what they saw in the game, how this certain team played and, and discussing uh, their situation and how maybe they could look to adapt um, what they're doing with their club and what they've seen in that particular session or that game. So again, it, it's, it's get, as I was saying before, it's getting away from a formal coach education to a much more informal, um, interactive way of uh, people learning. Talking about education, you uh, mentioned at the beginning, and Chris mentioned, that before you got into the game, you got yourself a degree. Yeah. Um, I, recently, there has been a, a, something with Wayne Rooney uh, talk about him not getting any GCSEs. Um, yeah. And his response was kind of like, yeah, I'm cool with that. Um, is it difficult for people to combine football with an education now? I think it's very difficult to, to be with a professional club and continue an education because uh, 
I think with with clubs now, they're wanting more and more time with the players, and uh, a lot of clubs now operate a day release scheme so that players will come out of school maybe one or two afternoons a week, so they'll miss school there. And then at 16, when they've done the GCSEs, then they pretty much have to choose between education and football, which is extremely early. And uh, it, it would be great, in my opinion, to have um, a program whereby someone could continue their education to a high degree and also um, you know, play football to that standard as well. And, and I've tried to do that at Repton School. I mean, we had a boy called Johnny Gorman, who was a scholar at Wolverhampton Wanderers and a sixth form pupil at Repton School. And he shared his time between Wolverhampton Wanderers and Repton School. And for the two years of his sixth form, he uh, he ended up with three A-levels to a standard where he could go to university. But he actually got a professional contract from Wolves. And he, even during his time at, at Repton, he played seven or eight times for the Northern Ireland full international team. So he came away with A-levels, international caps, full international caps, and a professional contract. So it can be done. They, they, you know, they, It's possible. But unfortunately, a lot of the times... The school will, will want make their demands on a, on a boy for education and the club makes their demands and it ends up that there's not a compromise. So um, I would like to see a, a lot more uh, emphasis on education in football, especially bearing in mind that the, the boys that sign at 16, by the time they're 21, the statistics are that only about one in five are actually still in football by the time they're 21. Those are the boys that go full-time into the football at 16. So that's a huge drop-off. And if they've not got their uh, good GCSEs and they've not got any A-levels, then there's no way that they can do what, you know, what I did and, and uh, use my degree for when I finish playing football. Do you think there's an attitude in the game that does not encourage people to be educated? My, in my opinion, yes. I think that, that people in a lot of people in clubs just see the world of football. And so they think that the only way forward for a, a boy is to be a professional footballer. Um, whereas for some boys, that's absolutely the case. You know, the, the, the best chance they've got of being successful in their life is in professional football. But there's lots of boys who have got lots of other abilities and lots of other opportunities. And, and they should be allowed, at 16, they should be allowed to explore all those different opportunities opportunities as well and certainly to get your A-levels I think is vital because if, if once you've got your A-levels if you then went into professional football for a couple of years and it didn't work out you could still then use your A-levels to go to university whereas if you don't have A-levels in your 2021 then there's very little uh, opportunity for you to access higher education. But if the club if the attitude within the game is not pro-education then it's unlikely to ever really happen. Is that well, this is what, in my opinion, this is one way that clubs could distinguish themselves because you, know, you clubs are, are, are trying to sign good footballers, and so for me, I look at I look at a, a boy that is possibly an excellent footballer, but he's also very good um, academically. That maybe he's looking to get A grades at GCSE. Well, if as a football club you provide uh, a scholarship scheme from 16 to 18 that isn't just based purely on football but provides a fantastic education as well then that that will be attractive to that boy surely so it's to me it's a way of attracting good players um by not just providing the football and pro- but providing high quality education as well and, and the week isn't that the, the boys can't train every minute of every day it's physically impossible so there's plenty of time during the week for them to to attend lessons and attend their football as well it just needs to say like with Johnny Gorman with Wolverhampton Wanderers then it just has to be worked out and, and you're talking Repton School is near Burton upon Trent and obviously Wolverhampton Wanderers in the West Midlands there's quite a distance there but if you actually had both of those very close to each other so had the education on the site of the football club or very close to that there's not much travelling at all so it's perfectly possible that the boys could have education in the morning and train in the afternoon or train in the morning education in the afternoon and even train again in the evening um, it's possible but it just needs the will of clubs to, to recognise how important it could be in, in producing also rounded individuals you know you, you'd rather have it as an employee you'd rather have someone that was um, educated and was intelligent with a with a rounded uh, as a rounded person rather than someone that was purely one dimensional and all they ever knew was football and once they've got their A-levels when they and if they do become pros 
they, like you said, they can't train every hour of the day. That's how a lot of players end up getting themselves into trouble. Once they've got their A-levels, they could use that time to get themselves further education. That, I know exactly. some of it do, but it's uh, a very small number. But again, it's a cultural thing. You know, it, it, It's got to be something that is seen as being positive rather than if you, if you try and pursue education in football, then a lot of the time that's looked down upon. You know, you get certain players, oh, well, he, he reads a broadsheet newspaper. Yeah. He gets the mickey taken out of it. Yeah. Um, so the culture within football is very much to, to mock education. Um, and, and so that would, that's something that I think the, the, the people in authority at football clubs and in governing bodies they should work extremely hard to try and promote a very pro-education culture so that actually it wouldn't be great if it was seen uh, as embarrassing and something to mock if you didn't have an education. You know, that it was the norm that people continued with an education. And I know that clubs will say, well, they, they do a, a B-Tech. You know, the boys that have scholarships at 16, they do a B-Tech. But really, if, if everyone's honest, a B-Tech in sports studies that, that they generally do is not um, a particularly valuable um, qualification to have. Whereas obviously A-levels have got a much higher currency. So having the ambition to say most of our scholars are going to are going to pursue A-levels and we're going to promote education, I think would be a far better stance to take than, than just disregarding education, really. Just finally, um, child protection has been in the news a lot recently. Um, what advice would you give to aspiring coaches to maybe protect themselves from allegations? Firstly, I would say I would take this subject very seriously. Um, child protection is extremely important. And if you are going to be involved with uh, kids football or kids sport in any any capacity then you need to make sure that you read all the relevant information there's lots of things online the fa put on on some great videos to to educate people so not don't just focus on the football side of it like everyone wants to just focus on the training session the games make sure you are totally educated in the in uh, child protection issues so that when you go into a situation with children you know exactly what you what you're facing and you have to make sure that you and the children are protected at all times so any anything that you say or do is following the guidelines that are issued by football association and what would some of the tips be like if you're going one-on-one with a child make sure there's another child there or another adult there yeah so like... yeah do it in public i mean so uh, one of the one of the ways that I've learned is the most effective is speaking to a, a kid one on one, you know, during a game or a training session. But you do that, you know, you, you have a word, say, Chris, come here a second, and you call them over and you speak to them in front of everyone so that everyone's there um, and everyone can see what's happening. That you're having that conversation with the young player and it's purely about football or whatever it might be because you might call him over and have a little giggle with him because yeah. again establishing that relationship and and uh, you know making sure that you connect with the kid is really important so it might be about anything but it's done in public you know a situation where you go into a room on your own with a child is just a complete no-no and, and something that people must be aware of um, and if you do you know if, if it's a serious situation for some reason where that child needs to be isolated to discuss you know, maybe a disciplinary issue, then you must make sure that there are other people there as well to act as witnesses um, to the, the, what you've said and done during that conversation. No lifts. Don't give a child a lift. That's oh, a, we, that's yeah. A, that's a classic just one, the, but that's, especially at grassroots level. Absolutely. Don't. Where, where you, you, think, you think you're helping and you think you're doing a good thing, but you're just putting yourself into... A difficult situation, and the child, because the child, you know, everyone's told not to, not, not to do that as a child, not not to go into a car with an adult. So, yeah, I think it's from both points of view, protecting the child and protecting the adults as well. I'd say before we finish, do you want to plug your social media? And coaches would like to get in touch with you. Yeah, I'm on uh, I'm on Twitter. Uh, my handle is Tom underscore S Soccer, um, and. Uh, I'm also my specialist soccer tours is on Facebook, and so you, you get my website earlier, specialistsoccertours.co.uk. Yeah. If there are people out there that would like to get in touch to uh, discuss tours or festivals, or or even if we could get this coaches only, um, you know, sort of informal coach education event off the ground, then you know, please look to get in touch that way. My my email for that is info at specialistsoccertours.co.uk as well so um, yeah several ways if people want to get in touch yeah I'll put, I'll put all the links in the description below this um, interview so so I've really enjoyed speaking to you today um, I'm sure Peter has as well 
and yeah, we'd lo- we'll love we'll, we'll to have you on again in the future. So. Okay, it's been a pleasure, Chris. Okay, thank you. And Peter, nice to meet you. Take care. Thanks. See you now. Bye-bye. Thanks. All right, so huge thanks to Tom for joining us today. So, um, next week we'll be joined by former assistant head coach of Charlton and current development phase scout at Everton, Damian Matthew. So it should be a good one. So, we haven't discussed scouting networking before. So. Looking forward to that. Yeah, that's it. Good night.